We're talking today with Joe Lang of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. And Mr. Lang, can you start with some background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born uh, October 9th, 1947, right here in Grand Rapids, born at St. Mary's Hospital. Okay. And did you grow up in Grand Rapids? All of my life in Grand Rapids, except for my service time. All right. Uh, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My father worked for Owen Ames and Kimball as a yard man, loading and unloading trucks. Uh, later for Sal Haney, Uptown Cleaners, and then as the store manager for the St. Vincent de Paul Society for nearly 20 years. Okay. My mother worked for 30 years for General Motors at the inland plant on Alpine and retired 30 and off through the UAW. Right. And how many kids were in your family? We, we, I come from a family of three boys. I'm the oldest. Uh, my brother is a dentist in Sparta, Dr. John Lang, uh, 22 months younger. And then a brother 11 years younger, uh, Jeff Lang, who deceased uh, seven years ago, uh, worked for General Motors and then Bosch after that. Okay. All right, uh, yeah, let's see, so then did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Catholic Central in 1965, went on to Aquinas College, had a full ride uh, financial aid scholarship, majored in biology, had a 4.0 my freshman year. Um, my wife graduated in 65, Mary Ann Borick from Catholic Central as well. Um, she started out in banking at Central Bank as a 17 year old high school graduate and has been in banking ever since, just retired in January and still working part-time at Founders Bank and Trust. All right. It's a lengthy uh, history. Now, when did you get married? We got married in uh, December of 1967. The Vietnam War was going on at full bore. Uh, recognized uh, that was a great opportunity. Aquinas College had a 30-day uh, break between semesters, and it seemed to fit, and we went ahead and got married. All right. Now then, okay, so then you, did you then complete your college education? No, I did not. Um, after, after, uh, shortly before getting married, I hired in at Heckman Biscuit on 28th Street in Madison uh, to, per, uh, extensively to work my way through school. Uh, the financial aid scholarship I had had uh, been offered as residual, family income being mm -hmm. what it was, didn't allow for uh, repeating that scholarship and I knew the next year my brother would be coming up, becoming a freshman. Uh, I actually wrote them and said if the scholarship's available, could they, I'd like to see him have it. And uh, found out that working full time, even though it was second shift, did not really allow with a science major, uh, didn't allow for you to keep up with your credit hours. Mm -hmm. So I fall behind. I had uh, 15 credit hours my fall term and dropped to 12 my next semester and uh, that's when the draft took place could not get uh, the rest of my credits in before the draft in July of 1968. All right so, so they didn't kind of regard background. you so they didn't regard you as a full-time student essentially? Was exactly that? I lost my student deferment and uh, was married with my wife expecting our first son Tom. Um, she was due in the fall and uh, that did not uh, preclude them from drafting you at that time. Mm -hmm. and currently didn't have enough physical defects to fail. I was classified 1A. All right. Uh, so when did you get the draft notice? I got the draft notice in June or May, I can't recall which. My draft number was 255, which was pretty high. I felt pretty secure. Um, the reason that didn't help was that uh, General Westmoreland had gone to Secretary of, Secretary of State McNamara, who presented to President Johnson the need for another 100,000 troops after the 68 Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those 100,000 that they drafted. All right. So they were reaching far and farther down into the pool in terms um, of the, the lottery numbers and so forth. And the interesting part about that historically had to do with what area you were in. If you lived in the city of New York, they had a lot larger pool. In a smaller city like Grand Rapids, they had less to choose from. Mm -hmm. So having lost a student deferment put me right up as 1A. Um, probably under other conditions, you wouldn't have drafted a married person with a child. Right. They had to meet their quota. Because a little earlier there had been limits or restrictions on that kind of thing. Yes. Sir. But you were coming late enough that those had pretty well gone away by then. Well, and I think they were only drafting up to the age of 28 and they pushed that out to the age of 33. They were taking so many. Mm -hmm. And uh, more on that later, one of the fellows that was drafted with me. 
Okay. Now take us through sort of the induction process. You get the letter, then do you go for physical or what? Well, I got the letter and protested to the draft board uh, that my wife was expecting and that uh, it should be at least postponed until she had the child. And uh, they, they postponed it till August 13th. Um, but the decision was that was irrelevant. They were going to draft me anyway. So August 13th, um, I, I, well, I should back up. My son was born nearly two months early, uh, coincidentally. My wife had my son on the 27th of July, and August 13th, uh, I went to the induction center, which was City Hall downtown, mm -hmm. the old building, which I believe is, uh, either the building is gone or it's the current empty building that had been the art museum. Um, we went down there by bus from there to Fort Wayne, Detroit, uh, went through a physical process, I have no central vision in my right eye, so they looked up the records to decide uh, what to do. The vision in my right eye was 4,400. Uh, they thought maybe they could defer me there, but uh, 4,600 was the requirement, and so I passed the vision test. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they what, kept what, me there and sent me from there to Fort Knox overnight. Now, when you're at the induction center, uh, at times you hear stories about people who try to find various ways to get themselves declared unfit or 4F, whether it was drinking too much sugar or doing oh, other kinds no, of I things. No, I never tried anything like that. But, but did you, were you, did you see anything like that? I wasn't aware of any of that either. I can't say it didn't happen. You were with a smaller group. They put you up in a hotel downtown overnight. You got there late in the day, mm -hmm. got up the next morning and did the physicals. I am entirely sure that some people did those things. I didn't witness it. But you didn't see it. Okay. So then where do they send you then for basic training? From there, they sent me to Fort Knox, Kentucky. There were a number of different basic training centers, but that was the closest one from the Grand Rapids. A mm -hmm. large quantity of people were going down there. You have to remember when you induct that many in that short period of time, um, it's makeshift. They actually opened up new barracks for, uh, for that uh, training company. Uh, my training company was B93. Uh, they had us go into a school building at the end of basic training and do all the chants, different companies against each other. And B93, the best lower B was our chant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a little bit to pump you up for, for uh, pride of Esprit de Corps, we'll call it. Okay. Now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to uh, life in boot camp? Um, let me share this story with you. I'm a pretty big guy now. I was six foot. I weighed about 220 pounds when I went in. Um, I had gotten heavier with the, the hours I worked, 50 hours a week, schooling and uh, yeah, regular meals. Mm -hmm. and the military tends to shape you down when you're a big guy and uh, beef you up when you're not. They never restricted my food at all, but there was enough exercise that they saw to it uh, that you uh, lost weight. Uh, the drill sergeant, Staff Sergeant Williams, took me aside after, after the process and said, uh, he always called me big man, he said, uh, you were one I had my eye on that I thought I would be cutting out of basic uh, because you were not in the best shape. And uh, he said, you proved me wrong. I, I got down from 220 to 170 in basic training, uh, initiatives on my own, extra exercises, uh, extra running after the day to make the one mile run that you were required to do. And then the sergeant was kind enough to help me with extra push-ups. In the Army, a push-up is up and down twice for one push-up. And he had a habit of saying, drop and give me 50 whenever he saw me. Mm -hmm. Although he did make me an assistant squad leader, so I know he liked me. Okay. Uh, now, did they also put a lot of emphasis on military discipline? As far Absolutely. As yep. Absolutely. Um, it wasn't unusual to do a lot of cleaning. It w when we moved into the building, it had been unused. Uh, we cleaned it uh, with hand brushes on our hands and knees repeatedly. Uh, I don't think you'd want to draw the image or comparison with what the Marine Corps did. Uh, was a little different than that. Uh, but, but cleanliness was next to godliness in the military, let it, let it suffice. We mm -hmm. had one person that had a problem with cleanliness, but uh, the sergeant left that up to us to resolve, and we did. You may have heard of blanket parties. He got a blanket party. And he got cleaned up, where our uh, powder our brushes and Lysol. So no more problem with that guy. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, how long was the basic training when you were there? Basic training, I believe, was an extended period of time. It was six weeks. I got there in August. We went through September and went on to advanced training in October. I think they had an eight-week program. It was six weeks originally and, and pushed to eight weeks, I believe. Okay. But I may be mistaken. Right. Did you the highlights were a 10-mile march in full pack. 
you had to do that, and then daily physical training, and then a PT test at the end. I'm sorry. Did well. You were you were kind of filling out the basic part. Uh, did you do the advanced training in the same place? Or? No, I was. Uh, each at the end of basic training, if you passed, and there were only five people out of 200 in the company that didn't, and there were various reasons for that. They usually got run back through a second. Uh, I can't remember what they called it, but they ran them back through a second training, and some was illness related, and some was inability to keep up. They they uh, assigned you your duty. I know the top guy in our company was George Washburn, and he got infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, they base that on your final PT test, your performance overall, and your skill levels. And uh, I think they also looked at the fact that I was married with a child and said, we're not putting him in combat infantry. Mm -hmm. So I, along with I think as many as 10 or 14 guys, were sent to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and they selected what types of training uh, you would have based on testing. I tested the weakest in electronics, and they made me a generator mechanic. There you go. All right. Uh, now, uh, describe a little bit the facility at Fort Belvoir. I mean, where exactly is it? Fort Belvoir is in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. If you went out to Arlington, Arlington, towards Arlington Cemetery, it would be uh, off the highway on the right. Uh, beautiful grounds, a beautiful um, um, base, if you will. It is the engineer school for the entire United States Army and the East Coast and part of the old guard. Washington, D.C. is surrounded by military bases mm -hmm. all the way around. Uh, Quantico, Virginia for the Marines, uh, Fort Meade, I believe. Uh, I don't remember all of them. Mm -hmm. We're, you're surrounded by right. military bases, and that goes back to early history. Um, the School of Engineers uh, is also the OCS School for Engineering. They throw up uh, construction bridges of different types, wooden timber, girder, and uh, learn to command in engineering, but our part of that was to learn how to operate a generator as a 52B10, and that we all uh, scored well in that, and they had moved us on and classified it as 52B30 and gave us a second session how to uh, assemble and disassemble generators and do major repairs. And that we graduated uh, just before Christmas in 1968. Uh, we're given orders directly to Vietnam from there protested that by law they were required, the Inspector General's um, office was required to allow us a 14-day leave before departing for a war zone, so we did that. Okay, so that was becoming kind of a, a normal procedure to, to, to protest or to argue an order? No, um, they sent us directly to Vietnam before Christmas of 1968, and the 28 of us in my training company went down to the Inspector General's office, I should clarify that, and piled into two cars and drove down to the office and said, wait a minute, this isn't right. And it was not a demonstration, mm -hmm. uh, it might have been a show of force, but it was certainly passive. We, we weren't trying to uh, attack anyone. We were all saying in, in a collective group, but the military law says you have to give us 14 days. And so they did that. Mm -hmm. So I got home for Christmas and left February 14th for Oakland, California. Okay. Now prior to the time that you went over to Vietnam, uh, how much did you know about what was going on over there or what you might have to expect? I hadn't really focused on the war in Vietnam much, uh, being married, working full-time, trying to go to school full-time. I certainly had not protested in any way. Mm -hmm. I wasn't involved in any of that. I was keenly aware there was a war in Vietnam going on. I had an uncle who had served in World War II, so there was a military background in the family. I was very proud of his service. He was in the 105, 105-millimeter artillery at Leyte, and uh, so I'd been regaled with stories of his military service, and his nephew was an officer in the Army Reserve or National Guard. So I'd been exposed somewhat to the military. Um, I had gone down after high school to enlist with a friend, Keith Moser, in the Marine Corps. He was 18, they took him. I was 17, my dad and mom refused to sign, they did not take me. Um, Why? So you? I had an interest in being a Marine as a kid growing up, but was not, if you would say, a hawk type person versus a dove. Mm -hmm. A person. So what had made you interested in enlisting in the Marines at that point? I, I had uh, always thought that it, it was important to demonstrate um, service to the country and the people in the country, and I always thought it was important um, for your own psyche, if you will, to, 
to, if you're going to do that, to do the, the most difficult part of it. I never look for the easy way out. You'll notice in talking about getting drafted, I protested, but I didn't continue to push it. Um, it was a difficult decision, but I felt it was my duty bound honor to right. serve my country. Right. I have more uh, opinion now about the war than I did prior to going in. And I can explain that later. All right. Uh, now, did you get trained by anybody who had been to Vietnam, or do you not know one way or another? Yes, I did. We had uh, Staff Sergeant Williams as my, my training sergeant. Uh, he had had both uh, elbows shot off, and he could stay in the front line in rest position for hours at a time. He did not regale us with stories about Vietnam, but in, in generalities, um, drove us and tried to, he was very um, strict disciplinarian, a very good trainer, um, had compassion up to a point. Uh, if you did what you could, he was proud to have you on his unit. And he, he, he didn't share old war stories, although we asked questions, he was pretty tight-lipped about it. We had a, an assistant squad leader who ran one of the other training platoons, who was a uh, corporal who had been a door gunner and later squad leader in Vietnam, and very young, couldn't have been more than 18 or 20 himself. Mm -hmm. uh, but none, none of the leadership although they're trying to build esprit de corps, really focused on what had happened. We had a lieutenant who transferred to our training platoon who had an injury to his right hand from a magnesium hand grenade. And uh, he insisted that when you passed him, you would salute him. And part of that was to demonstrate that as hard as it is to fold your hand to make a salute after his injury, he would do that. So that, that was the only other person I know of. Anyone that had been injured, that was the only one I knew of at that point. All right. Now, when you were training for the engineers, was there an open question of where you might go, or was the assumption going to be that everybody was going to go to Vietnam? The assumption was everybody was going to Vietnam, but there was no definitive answer to that. Um, I should explain and back up. Uh, the second training session ended early in December. Uh, we went home for our 14-day leaves and then back to Fort Belvoir as a holdover mm -hmm. until the middle of February. We didn't really get our final orders until we came back from the training or from the 14-day um, leave. Mm -hmm. part right. Me. So the, there was some question as to what it would be, where, when it would be, and where you'd go. And um, although I did get to go home in February briefly before going over. We went right from home right to Oakland. Some of the guys um, extended that. They, they can't really say they were AWOL, but they didn't report on time. And some of that might have been the fact that getting to Oakland was kind of on your own. Uh, they didn't give you a voucher to pay for your effort. You had to do that if you went home. Mm -hmm. they, get, they would get you there from the military base, but from your home base, you had to do that. Right. OK, so you get yourself out to Oakland now. It's February 69 now. Um, what kind, let's see, how did they get you then to Vietnam? In, in Oakland, it was a, a case of you took what gear you were assigned and your personal belongings with you. Uh, you were bunked down in a kind of a warehouse facility and uh, assigned a cot, and then they started uh, grouping people together for duties. I spent 24 straight hours on KP, Kitchen Police, and then was called right off Kitchen Police to say, you're leaving now. And so what they were doing was keeping people busy, putting you into a group for a flight to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the third day, I think, actually, more I think about it, that we left. And I left with Keith Roloffs and Don Copperud and Ed Williams and uh, Don Zwart from Seattle. And those are the last of the names I can remember. Okay. There were a few other people. Now, did they put you on a military aircraft or a chartered civilian plane? It was a chartered civilian plane. Uh, we left from Fort Douglas MacArthur Air Base, I believe, and they kind of screened you from the crowd uh, because that was in California and there was mm -hmm. a lot of uh, anti-militarism already at that point. Yeah. And they flew us to Hawaii, uh, which was beautiful. I'd never seen Hawaii before. And from Hawaii to Guam, which was a military base for the B-52 bombers. And then from Guam directly to Benoit Air Base, right outside of Saigon. Right. Uh, what was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there? 
Well, let me explain the flight from Guam. We're okay. on a C-130. Okay, now you're military aircraft. Yeah, and it's military aircraft. And you're in the jump seats the paratroops would use with your gear. And as we came in over the shoreline, we took incoming fire, so we had to circle back out. Um, landed at Benoit Air Base, they dropped the ramp down, and you saw a cordon of uh, aluminum caskets about 12 feet high, stacked five high or six high, as I recall. And they paraded you down the ramp through that cordon. Uh, we all noted when we got off there was a large hole in the wing about that big round and some smaller bullet holes in the fuselage. I was one of the last to get off and I asked the guy who dropped the ramp uh, that was incoming fire. He said, oh yeah, there, there, and there. And no one was hurt. Uh, they circled around, took a different route. So we already knew that you were going to get shot at. And seeing all the caskets said a lot of people were dying in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So you took it pretty seriously. The heat was oppressive. You're in the southern part of the country. It was very humid and damp. Um, they gave us lectures on behavior, what to watch out for, uh, how to move. They gave us a set of uh, pam pamphlets, or not really flyers, but booklets, um, part of MACV booklet in Vietnam, an infantryman's guide, and a phrases book, which I still have. Mm -hmm. um, I have very few phrases, however. Now, how much of that uh, orientation wound up being useful? Uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, first, of all, first of all, you learned that everybody you were with was as nervous as you were and that it was all for a good cause. Second, it gave you some time before they took you to your uh, uh, holdover company at Benoit to acclimate a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and thir thirdly, uh, it, it set a tenor of seriousness that was important to do because there was a lot of camaraderie and bravado as you first arrive. Um, there was a number of people that were draftees, but there was also a number of people that were enlistees. You tend to see the enlistees looking more for adventure and the draftees looking to do their service. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of explains it, I think. Okay. Did you know if there was there a group of people who tried to went and enlisted mostly to kind of beat the draft or try to there were some went. cases of that. Usually when that happened, what you saw was somebody trying to enlist in the Navy or the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And now that you've mentioned that, I did go both to the National Guard and the Army Reserve to see if there was any opportunity here locally to do that so I wouldn't have to leave my family. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no opportunities. They were filled up. Right. So that will give you a little flavor for a lot of people who are doing that, yes. Okay. Now how do you find out what your assignment is? They put you in the holdover company. It took about 10 days and then a lot of... Um, Military uh, personnel records did a lot of uh, sorting and deciding who was going where to what units. Um, fortunately for me, the group that I came over with, the main names I mentioned, Keith Rolos, and Doc Copperwood, went to the 4th Infantry Division, 124 Signal Battalion, because they needed generator mechanics. And uh, after about 10 days um, and doing various uh, Work, work duties to keep you busy. Um, just before I left, I found out you could walk down the street to one of the mess halls and uh, actually get a square meal mm -hmm. and sat down with two uh, older sergeants who welcomed you even as an inductee and had coffee with them and got a better flavor for what was going on from those two guys. Mm -hmm. um, we went, we, we turned in our stateside uniforms and were issued uniforms during that 10 days. Uh, jungle, uh, stateside fatigues for jungle fatigues. Our field jackets were taken away because in the southern part of Vietnam you didn't really need them for anything. And they were all loaded up and sent to the highlands where I ended up. Um, you, were, you, you weren't given your final gear like helmets. You were, I'm sorry, you were given a helmet. Uh, you didn't get your uh, weapon or bayonet or ammo or anything of that nature until you got to your unit. Um, the decision was made for that small group of us to go to the 4th Division. Once they had arranged a flight again, a C-130 cargo plane, we flew from Benoit to Pleiku Air Base. Uh, I thought I landed in stateside when I got there. They had green grass, an outdoor movie theater for Jeeps, a swimming pool on the ground, tarmac airstrips or concrete airstrips, and a walnut and brass rail with an etched glass mirror bar for the enlisted men's club. Far cry from where I ended up. All right. Well, that part looked look civilized, but then do you get to stay in, then do they send you off to a base from there? Or? From there by bus. 
Um, they loaded up one fairly large school type bus with grates over the windows, which told you right away you were going somewhere dangerous. Uh, what gear you had in a duffel bag you took with you and you bust from the Pleiku Air Base south of, no, north, I believe, of the city Pleiku through Pleiku to the Campanari Base, which was, if you would liken it to an appearance of, say, Missouri, where you have the red clay dust. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a large military compound. Housed the entire Fort Division and all of its units, and you were two weeks there as a holdover. And there was the final issuance of your gear, canteen, uh, everything that didn't belong to the company you were going to end up in. A little bit about the, the uh, holdover company. We were there two weeks or so. It was located along the perimeter where the airstrip was. The airstrip was a PSP airstrip, uh, which is perforated matting. It was intended for helicopters because there, there were uh, the first CAV helicopters assigned there to support the 4th Division. And it could land uh, what we call the Caribou, I believe it was a C-100, I can't remember, short takeoff landing vehicle, uh, airplane, uh, two engine uh, cargo plane. Uh, they weren't assigned there, but they brought in supplies and, and troops, etc. Now, was your battalion based on Campanari, or did you go somewhere else? Our battalion was based at Signal Hill in Campanari, which would have been uh, maybe 500 meters away from the holdover company. They actually marched us there, didn't have to truck us. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the battalion headquarters uh, on top of Signal Hill, and the motor, pool, motor pools in the 4th Division, at least, were around the outside perimeter, the 704th maintenance, the 124th maintenance, 155 artillery um, unit, and I don't know if that was a 14th or 42nd, I can't tell you that. And then the airstrip, and then another maintenance for um, possibly 3rd to the 8th mechanized infantry, and so on all the way around the uh, perimeter of the base camp. So from Signal Hill, you went down to the motor pool. Down in the motor pool area, towards the airstrip were the various companies, C Company first, C Company was um, one half of the company walk, and they did the mechanical maintenance for the vehicles. There were 414 vehicles, including generator trailers. And then B Company ran the generators and did generator maintenance. And then A Company was called a line company. They ran the wires uh, for signal communication, ran the communication connex um, trucks. They were, they were like a shipping container on the back of a truck that had all the radio signal communications mm -hmm. in it. Um, they, they were again A, B, and C company. There was also a detachment that did uh, um, photography and, and uh, another unit, and I can't remember what they called them, that was attached that did uh, surveillance and uh, I always thought it was spy work, uh, trying to determine uh, for the whole division what the photographs meant and, and uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what specific unit were you in and what were your duties? Originally I was assigned to C Company. Um, I'm trying to remember if I'm getting that right. I might have been assigned to B Company as a generator mechanic. The, there were a number of us that came up there as generator mechanics and the maintenance motor pool was run by a warrant officer at CW02, Command Warrant Officer 2, which is equivalent to about a captain. And uh, he interviewed each of us in turn. He talked to us as a group and then interviewed us each in turn and uh, mentioned that he didn't need any more uh, generator mechanics. And did anybody know how to work on trucks? And I threw my hand up. I had done um, maintenance. My uncle that I told you about that was in our artillery mm -hmm. worked for Bryant Chevrolet and then later Seabell. And I had spent a lot of time uh, because I was in the area of Catholic Central after school working with him and learned mechanics. So they put me on the job training as a truck mechanic. Then they interviewed two of us, I think it was Keith Rollis and myself, asking if we could type. I typed about 60 words a minute, he did about 30. So they drafted me to do all the paperwork and I became a maintenance motor pool clerk, truck mechanic and inspection uh, NCO I guess you'd call it. They promoted me from PFC. Everyone that went into Vietnam 
was ranked PFC or higher. Mm -hmm. Nobody came into the country in the Army lower than PFC. Uh, we all arrived as PFCs. We've been promoted from Private E2. Private E2 is a single stripe. PFC is a single stripe with a rocker. Um, very shortly after that, both Don and myself and Keith, all three of us were given a specialist fourth class uh, promotion, which was significant and made a big pay increase. Uh, combat pay at that time was $50 additional a month. So as a spec four, I was getting about $458 a month, sending all that home for my wife and child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, did you spend pretty much your entire tour on that in that same place? or Most of it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the sequence. Initially, the first few weeks, we were allowed to acclimate. We were given duties like KP, uh, part of my language, ship marine detail, uh, guard duty. Um, we could volunteer for reaction teams if we were attacked or if they wanted a, a group to volunteer to support, you could do that. So after about the first month, then they started working us into the maintenance work in the area. I did a lot of that. The generator mechanics and Don, my friend Don Copperwood and Keith Roloffs, both operated generators, and it wasn't unusual for them to go out to a forward fire base. Every forward fire base um, had to have somebody to run the generators. There were usually two generators. You ran one so many hours, uh, cycled the other one on, and, and shut it off and did maintenance on it. And that was the work that Don and Keith and the rest of the generator mechanics did. Because I could type, they kept me closer to the base, uh, but I was assigned to the Mountaineer Village. Everyone did at least two weeks, some six and some more, at the Mountaineer Village that we were responsible for. And let me explain that. The Mountaineer tribes were like the American Indian in the Central Highlands. The Vietnamese did not like them. Um, they would come and take their young, young men and enforce them uh, to work with the VC and NVA. Um, they were brave, but they were primitive. They were more into farming and gathering and hunting, uh, much again like the American Indian. They took a group of three different tribes. They weren't necessarily all cohesive. Put them together in a village. We had three Mountaineer villages. Uh, the names escape me now, but I can look, look that up, I'm sure. We had one that was assigned to the 124 Signal Battalion. Other units had other villages they were assigned to. We had a team there that uh, did um, security for them. Um, most of the time you had to escort them to the creeks to draw water because the VC, the Vietnamese, would snipe them, shoot them. And we determined that it would be a lot safer to dig them an artesian well, so we did that. In my photographs there's one picture of an artesian mm -hmm. well. Uh, they had a big celebration for that. Um, another event as an aside, and this happened while I was there, one of the guys, we used a three-quarter ton truck to transport food, etc., that we needed, equipment to the village, generators to bring them back and take them, and fuel. And a water buffalo had decided to station himself on one of the uh, span bridges they used to cross a creek and wouldn't move. And uh, they ran into him with a three-quarter ton truck, but he just bounced off. So the driver got out and shot the water buffalo. It's the only thing you could do. You couldn't get him to move. Uh, the, the, and there was a big concern about doing that because that was their tractor, you know. So the chief in the village got $300 in a, in a tin, tin roof for his hutch, and they cooked the water buffalo and had a big party. And uh, much nimpai, which is a rice wine they made, a homemade rice wine they made, was, was drunk at that time. Uh, now, like celebration. Did, now, did the mountain yards have sort of things they could do to, to support themselves? Or they're in this village and they're kind of surrounded by BC. Well, we, we helped them set up farming. Mm -hmm. um, they were more gatherers and hunters than that. They were very gifted, and I wish Don were here to share with you because he he's a, was a teacher in, in, in Minnesota and actually put together a, a slide presentation for his students showing that they would take a piece of bamboo uh, about 18 inches to 3 feet long, hollow it out, um, leaving one end closed, and then um, over an open fire, cook the water buffalo and their meat, whatever that was going to be, stuff it in that tube, and then take rubber plants, leaves, and then close the other end, heat that on the fire, and it would be just like sealing it with rubber. And they had actually small buildings on stilts that they would store the meat in. It would last quite a while. So they were pretty much self-sufficient in that regard. Um, 
Same thing with grain. They had um, um, pots that they would store their grain in. Uh, we just facilitated their salt protection, provided them with weapons, usually outdated. We didn't give them brand new M16s, but 12 gauge shotguns, left of World War II uh, equipment, and they would uh, scout for the uh, infantry, the men, and then protect their, protect their village as best they could. It became easier to protect their village when you could group them together, mm -hmm. uh, more than one tribe in one area. They would make pottery and sell that, uh, things of that nature. Okay. Now, what kind of operations was the division conducting while you were there? Were they kind of going out into the countryside looking for trouble? or? Yes, um, but you have to remember by the time I got there in 1969, the 4th Division had gone over by boat in 1965. Uh, Campanari was a new base they built. The captain who had, had been the first to die is what they named it after, Captain Anari. And uh, prior to that, they were occupying uh, areas um, uh, chiefly handled by the 101st Airborne. So they were supplanting that. Um, it had been decided that, for example, the 69th Armor, uh, which were the tanks from Ken Fort Knox, Kentucky, mm -hmm. actually, could not operate in the um, Delta region where they were originally signed, I believe, to the 7th or 9th Infantry Division. So we swapped units. We took the 30, 35th Infantry, 14th, I believe, Artillery, 42nd Artillery, and 69th Armor to the Highlands. So they made their own base eventually there. By the time I got there, it was pretty well established. The barracks were already built. There were concrete floors, uh, incandescent lights, which were replaced with fluorescents after they came available. Um, Captain Hoy was the C Company commander that I first served in. Um, he had a penchant for wanting a koi pond, so they actually built a concrete pond in the parade ground area, not that you could hold parades in daylight. And it never got filled with water, but it was always a point of humor. He also put fire alarms in the company area for alerts, and uh, that was inverted 105 howitzer shells painted orange, and uh, wooden walkways. And the importance of that was during monsoon season, it was muddy there. Um, it be very difficult to traverse anything without it. Um, ditches were dug around the individual barracks, and uh, that was to allow the water to keep from washing the buildings away because they would do that in the monsoon season. And then part of our duties were to gravel coat the parking lot after we got there in 1969 and put down Prino Prime, which is the same kind of sealant they used on the PSB matting in the airstrip and then pea gravel on top of that, so you had an actual substantial area that wouldn't wash away. Um, we also took uh, galvanized roofing and made uh, four, two by four framework, attaching that to it and backfilling with sand instead of sandbags for protection around the barracks. Uh, so that if you had an artillery or mortar round, or not artillery, but mortar round or rocket attack, uh, you had some protection. If it came unexpectedly. Yeah. How much enemy activity was there? I mean, how regularly did you get hit with rockets or mortar bombs or whatever? Um, while a holdover in Benoit, they attacked the perimeter during the night at least three times during the 10 days I was there. While a holdover at Campanari during that two week span, uh, they attempted to overrun the base camp perimeter and we were mortared and rocketed several times. Um, after moving to C Company, during the first week I was there, they rocketed, Signal Hill was a big target for them. They used 122 millimeter rockets and, and mortars and rocketed and mortared the battalion headquarters area and blew up the A Company barracks and made the national news right after I got there, actually. My wife was watching the attack on television and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. um, now, when an attack like that came, would it just be a few rounds and then nothing, or would it be more Some, intense? Sometimes. Um, during that first year, an entire, I believe, NVA battalion attacked the airstrip area, uh, broad daylight. I want to say it could have been 9 or 10 in the morning. Um, by that time, I was part of a reactionary team. I was actually a rifle squad leader. And uh, we were called out. I took my M16, two Bandler's ammo, a couple of grenades, my flak jacket and helmet. The, uh, perimeter, the perimeter was a series of barbed wire and a clearing with some buried explosives and some booby traps. And then a guard tower, if you can envision that, just like you have at the prisons mm -hmm. nowadays, with a sandbag bunker at the base. 
and then two more sandbag bunkers and another guard tower all around uh, base camp. This particular attack, they use satchel charges. I don't know, they're about yay square like a canvas bag, and blew up three bunkers, I believe. During the day, they were lightly manned by infantry units, two men to a bunker. So there were six men that were disintegrated. There were no bodies. One guard tower and two small uh, bunkers were blown up, and a large area cleared uh, by the NVA to the airfield. Airstrip. They were after our long-range patrol snipers who were uh, bunked in that area and the helicopters. Um, Don has actually some pictures. Uh, either I didn't have my camera at that point or I wasn't taking pictures of it. But um, they blew up a helicopter, they blew up some trucks. Altogether 11 men were killed, uh, six in the bunkers and five in the company area. I ran out down the perimeter road on each side is also a drainage ditch so the road doesn't wash away. And the last working guard duty area was the signal tower, was the tower. They had an M60 machine gun in the towers and other weapons. And uh, I began firing and at that point began to recognize they were penetrating in a pretty good group. And I turned to look and I found I was alone. I uh, started to look for someplace else to go and uh, felt somebody grab me out of the drainage ditch and pull me up onto the road. It was the company sergeant. I won't say exactly what he said, but he said, don't you want to live to see your wife and son again? Had you been standing up at that point? Yes, but crouched in the, in the uh, drainage ditch firing. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy in the signal tower was actually trying to signal it as quick shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to get blown up, I think. And the company sergeant, uh, top sergeant, took my rifle away and put me in the uh, bunker. Probably saved my life. So I'll let it go at that. It was not an heroic act on my part. I thought the whole group of rifle squad was out there. I didn't know I was alone. So well, that was one of the few times. It was not unusual to come under fire when you pull guard duty. The 124 Signal Battalion and other units provided, um, I think we had, there were 13 bunkers on the American side of Dragon Mountain. And different units had different bunkers. The infantry had the ones out at the point, bunker one, two, three. Um, the other units rotated the bunkers four, five, six, and then the um, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13 bunkers on the inside. The Arvin Army had the other half. They closed the gate at dusk and locked it and kept the Ar Arvin Army on their own side. Uh, not really sure if that was for their protection or ours. And uh, we manned uh, various bunkers. I remember being in Bunker 4, Bunker 7, Bunker 13. And it wasn't unusual to come under fire or even ground attack on occasion. I can remember a case there where Bunker 1, 2, and 3 were blown up, uh, probably by B-40 rockets or mortar, and uh, I was in Bunker 4. Um, that left a lasting memory. I can remember being in Bunker 13, they had a 50 caliber machine gun mounted in that one. We came underground attack. Uh, I actually got to fire the 50 caliber then, don't, don't know if I ever hit anything, uh, being dark. One of the that was my kind of, yeah. memories of that kind of one of the sort of I guess the the, the cliches or the assumptions about <coughs> service in Vietnam is that you, you you have the grunts who were humping it out in the hills and the rice paddies and you got the guys in the rear who, who have a relatively nice life but you're maybe in Saigon yeah but <laughs> Camp but, Bernaria was yeah, pretty rustic yeah but 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 where you were I mean you had I mean you were coming under fire on a fairly regular basis there were attacks yes. and things like that but you were officially in a support position and you know you, you were a typist but you were doing all of this stuff too. What that really said was I did all the maintenance work that had to be done and I did the ordering and typing of parts, which meant double duty, mm -hmm. not less duty. But a lot of times it kept you from having to do kitchen patrol, KP. Um, by the time I had been in Vietnam for six months or so, Vietnamization was taking place and they were actually bringing civilians in to do the laundry, the ship burning details, mm -hmm. part of my language, and uh, the tire repairs and things of that nature. You were actually trying to occupy them, give them a little bit of money to improve the economy. It was a good initiative, but also a dangerous one. Uh, we caught one of the Papasans that worked in the tire area. At lunchtime, I, we had a dispatch patch shack so you could send out trucks and record that and bring them back in. And I volunteered to do that so the dispatcher could have lunch. While I'm doing that, I noticed this little Vietnamese pacing off the different buildings and reported that to the 
company sergeant, top sergeant, and uh, sure enough, he was VC. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing happened. That's why we were attacked as often as we were. Um, a gentleman who was a forward observer in the 42nd Artillery shared with me at our national uh, reunion meeting that the reason he volunteered for the forward fire bases where they didn't get mortared and rocketed like the divisional base camp did, we presented a very large, easy to shoot at target. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't unusual every few days to take mortar rounds or rocket rounds. Uh, not necessarily a large scale attack, but harassment. Distinctly remember Papa San Bond telling me one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, don't be in the barracks tonight. How he knew what he knew, I don't know, but mm -hmm. it was four o'clock before they actually hit us with mortar rounds. And uh, I shared with the rest of the people in the barracks, there were about 40 guys from the barracks, don't be in the barracks tonight. Mm -hmm. We were in the bunker. All right. As far as you could tell in the area where you were, what sort of uh, relationship or dynamic existed between the VC out there in the hills and, and the villagers, and the people in the community? There, there, there was a case of uh, constant you have to remember the reason that the 4th Division was placed where they were was to be not too far off the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia. And so there were a lot of incursions of formal NVA groups through the 4th Division area. You can read the history for yourself. I've done that. Uh, and we were there to stop that or at least curtail it. The NVA would, uh, in conjunction with the VC, coerce support, rice, food for food, uh, Whatever, whatever they could get from the locals, um, either voluntarily or by threat, and there was some physical violence that happened there. Um, I can't say I witnessed directly a lot of that, but I saw some results of it and effects of it. And um, um, the VC and NVA treated their own people worse than anything the Americans could have done to them. We were out there trying to support them and help them, and the VC and NVA weren't necessarily that kind. They were actually executing teachers, leaders, things of that nature. Um, I know that to be a, to be a fact. Um, not much publicity along those lines in the press, but that's what really happened. And, and um, our, our vulnerability was that our, some of our forward fire bases were overrun. Uh, a couple of incidences, the Poloi Duck incident, Top Sergeant McInerney in 1966, I believe, shortly after the unit arrived, or 1965 walked into a battalion size uh, NVA uh, compound in the jungle looking for two short-range patrol or long-range patrol people that had disappeared and his company was pretty well wiped out. That's how he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And then the 12th, 22nd Infantry, that was the 8th Infantry, the 12th and 22nd Infantry uh, has the 12th of May incident that took place where a number of, of infantrymen were killed. Again, by a large size force from the north and VC support. Um, both of those, believe, predated the 68 Tet Offensive, so it was dangerous from the beginning mm -hmm. and got worse later and never really went away. Uh, while we're speaking of that, the Tet Offensive everyone remembers was 1968 because of the scope and scale of it. I'd like to point out that January, February, and March of 69, was a Tet Offensive, that was the attack I mentioned that I was involved in and uh, later in the month. And then in uh, 1970, after the division moved to An K, we had another attack. I had turned in my weapon, it's now March, I'm getting ready to go home. Uh, I think only a day or two left to go, I had no weapon. Uh, and uh, VC or NBA, I have no idea because I didn't see them attack the perimeter. Uh, came through the dog handling compound area, passed the 124 signal battalion, headed down towards the airstrip. And um, my memory says that we hadn't had our artillery set up yet. And I don't know why this, this comes to mind, but there was a battle cruiser or ship off the coast that actually fired at the VC in the base camp. I can remember a large roar that sounded like a freight car going overhead. And later questioned the NCOs about what that noise was, and they said artillery from the uh, ships because ours wasn't ready to fire yet. So it was very impressive to be able to be that far away and actually support us. Yeah. So you're in a lot of situations where, where their bases are getting attacked and sometimes substantial force is doing it. Uh, what kind of losses would the enemy suffer in those? Would they take a lot or? Yes, I would say numerically they did. Um, 
I don't think the Bataan attack in 1969 that I was talking about was very successful for them. We lost 11 people. They probably lost 10 times that. Um, there were several other incidences where they were bold enough to make attacks, and I can't say that the entire attacking force was wiped out, but quite frequently the Americans had the best. Actually, the Americans won every battle. Uh, I can't say we didn't have any units that weren't decimated, but usually, um, e even that attack that I talked about at Poloi Duck, they lost as many or more than we did. It, it, it was a case of trying to fight a defensive war instead of an offensive war for us. We had the, um, the military might, if you will. Uh, it wasn't unusual to, to see uh, um, jet fighters called in. It wasn't unusual to see Cobra gunships called in. Um, I can remember one base camp attack where a light observation helicopter was shut down, shot down. He was, and these guys were brave, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it. He was drawing enemy fire from the gorge at the base of uh, Dragon Mountain right outside the uh, perimeter opposite the 124 Signal Battalion Motor Pool, uh, flying low at dusk and, and into the evening to draw that fire. And then two helicopter Cobra gunships were, we call them high up. Um, when he pulled up, they would come down and do their rocket and uh, minigun attacks on the enemy. And I don't know how many uh, flights he made over that area, but at one point he got shot down and burst into flame. And it's just like in the movies when a helicopter goes down, they burst into flame. Mm -hmm. the, unlike the Hollywood pension for showing your cars bursting into flame, the helicopters do that right now. Um, one of the Cobra gunships continued to call him to tell him that, uh, get out, get out. They kept saying that. His speaker was evidently on because they were communicating back and forth. We could, we could hear it. And uh, he wasn't going to be getting out. Uh, of course, the entire helicopter, including him, was engulfed in flames. The Cobra gunship landed, and for some reason we could hear the pilot and co-pilot talking back and forth. The pilot got out, disconnected his um, whatever he had, helmet, and ran into the fire to drag the pilot of the low chow. Um, the co-pilot got out of the Cobra gunship, knocked the gunship pilot to the ground, put out the flames and put him back in the helicopter and they flew away. There was no saving this mm -hmm. man. That's a, uh, a uh, memory that uh, came back to me a few years ago that I'd forgotten about. And uh, that, that, that was a thing I witnessed that I've never seen such bravery and concern and care for one unit to another as to mm -hmm. what went on. But that demonstrates the bravery these people had. Right. Um, they later brought in a uh, spooky gunship, which is a low-flying slope. They were like a DC-4 and uh, pelted the area with minigun fire, kind of put an end to the attack. Uh, very impressive to watch that close up. And did you witness any B-52 strikes? Not personal and up close. Um, happened to be in divisional base camp and it felt like an earthquake happening when they were running a B-52 strike t uh, 10 clicks, I believe, away, 10,000 meters away, mm -hmm. and the ground shook. And then on a patrol, reactionary sweep, something of that nature, we walked through an area that looked like uh, the moon. It was cratered so heavily, 500 pounders from B-52 raids. Uh, again, that was to force the North into negotiations, I believe, at the Taiwan. I think Geneva is what well, they Paris. In Paris. Paris. Yeah, that's right, Paris. So that's what that was about. You have to remember we were in Vietnam while they were doing all those negotiations, so mm -hmm. we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The uh, okay. Did you have a kind of daily routine while you were out there in that base? Was there a yeah, absolutely, pattern? and let me share that with you as well, and then we'll get into the specifics of what I did towards the end of my tour. Uh, they, they could not stand daylight formations. They did have a company parade area outside the company headquarters. Uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, you got up for Reveille, and usually one guy would answer for five or six. We didn't always all get up. But uh, they wanted to be able to account for the soldiers, of course, that were there. So you got up at 4 o'clock, went back to your barracks. Uh, mess hall opened around 7. By 8 o'clock, you had to have been done eating and, and back up for duty. Usually you showered in the evening, so you'd get up and get dressed go for, for breakfast if you're in the base camp uh, for, for mess at uh, sometime between 7 and 8 and be up in the motor pool by 8. You worked uh, till lunchtime sometime between 11 and 12, went down to the motor, 
went down to the mess hall to eat, or back to the barracks if you chose not to. We didn't always eat meals in the mess hall. Uh, it was unusual to have your own food and uh, take a break and write a letter home, or just relax because you're pretty tired. Back up to the motor pool by uh, noon or one o'clock and continue to work on vehicles and whatever whatever generators had to be repaired. Uh, sending trucks out, bringing them in, teaching guys how to uh, keep the trucks lubed and in, in condition, repair damaged vehicles. It wasn't unusual for them to get shot up or rocketed, whatever. And then uh, again, break at five or six for, for evening chow, uh, whatever. And uh, back up to the motor pool sometimes till midnight, uh, continuing with whatever projects had to be done. If you had to get generators ready to send out to a fire, fire base, if you had to load up uh, food or, or uh, support equipment for a forward fire base, you did that. We had some teams of traveling teams where they take a three-quarter ton truck and a trailer. Um, Larry Ball, I believe, or Albert Ball, and another, uh, he was a buck sergeant, and another specialist would go out and take parts out of the various floor fire bases and stay at one base for a couple of days and then go to another, come back for resupply, that sort of thing. Um, at least once a week, usually twice a week, you pull guard duty. It was rotated amongst the 88 men in the motor pool. Uh, we had three or four of the bunkers on Dragon Mountain. So that would be three guys to a bunker, I think about 12 people. So you were talking some 12% of the group. Guard duty started at dusk after chow. You'd drive up with your rifle, backpack, uh, drinking water, grenades, ammo, helmet, flak jacket and uh, go up on the truck along with the other units, people that were going for guard duty. Be assigned by the staff up there what bunker you had, uh, par parcel off into groups of three. A lot of times it was Ricardo Montalban, not the actor, a uh, Cuban, the several of us, Don and myself. Uh, cute story about Ricardo in a minute. And uh, then you decide how are you going to do your shifts. Uh, as soon as it got dark, one guy would do the first four hour, or first three hour segment, probably um, eight, seven, eight, nine o'clock whenever it got dark for three hours. The next guy would do the next three hour segment, say midnight to three in the morning. And the last guy did three till dawn, five, six, whatever. You were on duty from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. and got the next day off. The nice thing was they fed you breakfast up there before you went down and you could shower and you could just kind of relax that next day. So that happened once minimum, sometimes twice a week. And were attacks usually at night when they happened? Almost always, although there were several. The one I mentioned, the battalion size, was in broad daylight. Uh, the one at, that was at Play Coup, the one at IMK was also broad daylight. There were two of those while I was there, and I was only there 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, the whole division had moved, getting ready to pull out. Everybody left but the 124 Signal Battalion. And I left in March of 1970. The uh, division left by December of 1970 but left behind the 10th Cavalry, one of their attached units, mm -hmm. and the 124 Signal Battalion for support. And they stayed in the area and continued to function as the uh, final part of the Union, uh, final part of the division withdrew. And I think by 73, they were all gone. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, how would you characterize morale in your unit? I would say morale was okay. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, anti-war sentiment. Um, there was mostly focus on getting through this okay and getting home. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say you have to remember what went on during that era, 1966 to 1970, 1975. Uh, I distinctly recall in 66 or 67 race riots happening in the city of Grand Rapids. There was some racial tension. There was some racial tension in Vietnam as well. Uh, by and large, that was minimalized. Uh, one of the good friends that, that I served with, Tom Houston from Houston, Texas, uh, was African American. We partnered up for a lot of our patrols and things of that nature, uh, guard duty on several occasions, uh, became good, fast friends. But there was some racial tension. Uh, we had a sergeant, staff sergeant, who was African American that was responsible for security at the Enlisted Men's Club in the company area, and that was just a place to get a, a can of cold beer mm -hmm. and uh, listen to music um, when you had off-duty time. Uh, he had set up periodically one night during the week, maybe a Friday night or a Saturday night, where African Americans only could use the club, 
and we had a buck sergeant who took exception to that and managed to go, to go over there and incite a near riot. Uh, he was attacked by a dozen or so uh, African Americans. The only reason I know that is I went out in my underwear and my Ho Chi Minh sandals and rescued him from being beaten near, near to death. Um, he thanked me for that, but I had some negative words for him about being so stupid. And the next time this happened, I got dressed up and went over there because by that point I was running the maintenance motor pool and this staff sergeant was reporting to me. I'll explain that in a minute. And I went in and ordered a beer and they weren't going to serve me. And I said, you have to serve me. And uh, this, the security guy, this staff sergeant, uh, told me you better give him a beer because he had to report to me. How that came about was Sergeant First Class Dryer was our senior NCO. He was uh, called home in January or so of 1970. And the warrant officer, Mr. Harvey Curry, CWO2, called me aside and said, Lang, you're going to run the motor pool. And I looked at him kind of funny and said, but sir, I'm a specialist fourth class. You have three staff sergeants, five buck sergeants. Shouldn't you be picking one of those? And he said, I've made my decision. You're going to run the motor pool. And I said, but sir, they all outrank me. And he said, well, cut yourself some orders and make yourself a sergeant first class. Um, I never did that. I always wore my spec four shirt, and uh, they all reported to me. The reason he had me do that was um, I had some college education. I had leadership potential, apparently, in his mind. And uh, he had me move the motor pool from play coup to IMK. He knew that was coming. I didn't. And uh, we packed up all 414 vehicles, trucks, and trailers, transported them through a series of convoys uh, through the Mangyang Pass. You may recognize that name. That's where uh, the fall, not besides Dien Bien Phu, the Mangyang Pass is where the division of French were defeated. All right. Uh, we are out of tape right here. So I'm going to pause that. Okay, um, we were basically at the beginning of a point where we were starting to talk about actually having to move the division out of Pleiku off to Anke. Okay. You know, what part of the country was Anke okay in, or how long a trip was that? Pleiku Play was on the Cambodian border. Anke okay was towards the coast. It was 101st Airborne Base. They weren't exactly right directly across from each other, but if you looked on a map, it appears they are. The Mangyang Pass is an area 88 miles long. The convoy was a little bit of a circuitous route, but there's only two major highways, one north-south, Highway 1, and one east-west. Uh, and I may have misspoke myself on that. Might be Highway 1 was east-west. No, Highway 1 was the north-south. I thought it was, too. The, the, the other roads were not always paved, and uh, what was happening was the negotiations were taking place in Paris. The 4th Division it had been decided was going to be removed from the country. They were brought in in 65. They were leaving in 70. They were there about five years. My unit had to move from Campanari because we were turning over Campanari to the Arvin Army. Mm -hmm. The Campanari sat very near the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the idea was for them to defend themselves. Again, remembering tanks could be used in the Highlands, and the 69th Armor was the main tank unit in the American Army in the Central Highlands. Now they had tanks and other units and APCs, armored personnel carriers. So our goal was to move our 414 vehicles from Campanari through the Mangyang Pass to An K. Um, we would put together as many vehicles as we could that made sense and get permission for them to leave. And there was a jump off point where we met to the main highway. Um, you were held up and waited. You got there at 5 in the morning and queued up so the whole convoy would be ready to move together because you may come under fire. And we did. Uh, they held us up at a point where there was a bridge over a small river. It had a bypass with an American two-lane steel span. And uh, we waited for them to mine sweep. Um, that area was guarded by, I believe, the 3rd to the 8th mechanized infantry. They had an APT, APC station there. It wasn't unusual for them to have a barbed wire perimeter on the Mangyang Pass with some sandbagged areas and a um, generator mechanic running the generators. And the APCs would go out during the daylight and be in different areas securing that area of the Mangyang Pass and then come back to the base. And I've forgotten the names of the bases. There was LZ English, LZ Mary Lou. I, I can't remember, Blackhawk. I don't remember who was at what bases mm -hmm. anymore. 
Um, this particular APC was there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I saw this curious. There was a guy up coming out of the top turret, and he just stayed in that position for a long time. Once they finished mine sweeping, they let the convoy proceed. And when I looked back, there was no backside to the APC. There was a small hole where a B-40 rocket had been, and there was no bottom half to that guy. The uh, convoy was held up at that point, and that put quite a thought into my mind about what we were going to be going through. And this was my first convoy. We proceeded through a couple of different areas, made some turns, went through some small villages. Um, sometimes you'd speed up and be doing nearly 50 miles an hour, and sometimes you'd slow down and be crawling. We got under the Manyang Pass and we came under attack. The whole convoy stopped. To our right, as we were heading towards Anke, okay, it sloped down to a field and then up to a tree-lined area across the creek. And fire was coming from that tree-lined area onto the convoy. So they had us dismount from the vehicles and lock and load, be ready with our weapons. And um, we didn't have an attack unit in the area. We had escorts. Every so many vehicles would have twin 50 caliber machine guns, quad 60 caliber, and they had welded PSP matting and sandbags and things for a convoy escort. Uh, we escorted the convoy either with a quarter ton Jeep with a 50, 60 caliber mounted in it, or a three quarter ton truck or deuce and a half that might have a 60 caliber mounted on a scarf ring. But the other vehicles um, just had two guys to a vehicle, uh, both armed with an M16. Uh, so we dismounted and uh, they called two of the fast flyers, uh, DC or uh, F4 Phantoms as I recall, and they napalmed the hillside. Uh, gave us a real view of what that was like. You could actually feel the heat from that mm -hmm. far away. Um, proceeded on with the convoy to Anke. Kay. Took the vehicles in there to the motor pool area at Anke, which was, they had Hong Kong Mountain in the middle of their base camp. I always wondered why they do that in the Army. And then the 101st Airborne had a jet strip, and then the air strip was next to that, and then again the signal battalion, the motor maintenance, was on the outside perimeter. The dog handling unit, the K-9 unit, was to our right, I'll say, in the perimeter behind us. So we would go, park the trucks, take off whatever parts we needed from the remaining vehicles, throw them in the three-quarter ton truck that we happened to be using, sleep overnight, get breakfast, and take off at 5 o'clock in the morning and convoy back the other way. I remember doing that over a period of two to three weeks. Moved all the vehicles, set up the maintenance motor pool, and by then I was down to my last week or two in the Army, and uh, my friend Don and I processed all together. They kind of turned us loose. Mm -hmm. How many convoys did you run, do you think? I, I, can, I couldn't tell you how long. Uh, it was every other day for about three weeks, and we took turns at it. Al Grinnell, Spec 5, mm -hmm. uh, myself. Um, Don did not partake in the convoys. He was out at the uh, Mountain Yard Village. But uh, some of the other NCOs, Rich Bonger, who had our parts, went and he set up his parts area. And uh, I remember going back that last time. And I think I was in Headquarters 7, the quarter ton Jeep. And the warrant officer said to me, You have to go out to the Mountain Yard Village and get Don. He doesn't want to come back. We had what we call going gone Asiatic. Mm -hmm. He was going to stay with the Mountain Yard tribes. And uh, that was one of the unsavory things I had to do. I had to go back to the Mountain Yard village and bring him back to the base camp and then move to on case so we could go home. I had forgotten about doing that until he reminded me a couple of years ago when we met after the 4th Division reunion in Illinois. Uh, he said, do you remember why you were here with the Mountain Yard village? And I said, no. I don't recall him, and he proceeded to tell me that uh, you came to get me because I didn't want to leave. So that was very interesting. You don't hear about very many people not wanting to leave. Well, it happened. Um, at at on K, the warrant officer came to me and said, uh, I put you in for the Bronze Star, but circumstances are such that we couldn't award that to you. There were only so many allowed, and somebody else got it was a buck sergeant mm -hmm. who did a very heroic thing, so I'm not criticizing that. I didn't think I merited it either. They gave me the Army Commendation Medal, and he took me aside and told me that Don and I were both getting those. And then said, um, the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Ordinghorn, wanted to meet with me. He wanted me to um, re-enlist. They offered me a $56,000 re-enlistment bonus, promotion from specialist fourth class to staff sergeant. That's two grades. Mm -hmm 
and uh, opportunity for Officers Candidate School if I would re-enlist for three years. So they sent me out to uh, battalion headquarters and uh, I went in and talked to Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Odiorn. He was also from Michigan, he was from Detroit. And he said to me, didn't you volunteer to pull duty on Christmas Day so everybody could be off? And I said, yes. He said, you did things like that more than once, didn't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, here's what we'd like to do. Mr. Curious recommended you for promotion. We'd like you to go for the Board of Review. It'll be more of a summary type thing. It's more, um, it isn't going to be a very a formal thing. It'll, it's just a case of, of, of you being interviewed by myself, the XO, and a few other people. And I said, sir, I'm down to my last 14 days. I would like to go home to my family. I'm not going to re-enlist. I wish you'd offer this opportunity to somebody else. And I left. Um, after I went home, there was a specialist fourth class that they brought in. And they, um, they offered him the same thing. Mike Grobelch is his name. I didn't know that at the time, that he was in A company, the line company. Mm -hmm. They brought him in, offered him staff sergeant promotion if he would re-enlist. He did re-enlist. They made him staff sergeant. He got the bronze star, and he earned it. But he tells me the story that he went Asiatic. He was over there the remaining three years, 70 to 73. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they, they did convoys with the 124 signal battalion, provided generator support for the units that remained, um, worked with the um, Vietnamese, the Arvins, and uh, he, he, he didn't really want to come home either, I guess, at, at the end of it. But uh, that did happen occasionally. It didn't happen for me. I had a family yeah. to go back to. And he was uh, you mentioned the, the lieutenant colonel. Was it Odierno? O Odierno. Is it like, like Raymond Odierno? The one no, that no that's, that's the general. It was yeah. Odiorn. O okay. With an o there. And I don't know his first name anymore. All right. Not the same um, but he had, but the, the 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 general who became important in Iraq and so forth actually had fourth division connections too. So yes, just, yeah, okay. and I and I could be mistaken. It might have been that it, that he was the same man. I don't remember. I know his name was. We called him Odiorn, Colonel mm -hmm. Odiorn. Uh, I would think it would be I'd be hard pressed to say that it was the same man because uh, that would have been 1970. Yeah, but and the use of Vietnam. It's possible. Yeah. yeah, it's very possible. It could have been. Uh, he was a great guy, and so was uh, Ray Odiorno. All right. Uh, let's go back to a few other dimensions of, of the you know, experience out, out there at, at Camp Inari. Uh What is your Ricardo model bomb story? Ricardo was a, a Cuban immigrant. Um, it wasn't unusual for people that had a green card and weren't necessarily citizens to be drafted. A friend of mine from work was of Dutch heritage, never was an American citizen, and served in the war in Vietnam at the same time I was there. I don't know whether Ricardo was an American citizen, citizen or not. He was definitely Cuban and professed to be, lived in Florida at the time and was drafted. And uh, frequently he and Don Koprud and I would pull guard duty on Dragon Mountain. And during the early stages of monsoon season, we were on a bunker in the inner area of the mountain that had a walk through level, it wasn't a climb into bunker, it had a doorway and a poncho liner hanging in it. And it got to be dark and the three of us had decided that we were all going to stay up that whole night and pull the guard duty together because we could all sleep the next day and we were a little more experienced than the new guys. And uh, while we were talking we noticed what looked like a dog stick its head into the bunker, we thought trying to get in out of the rain. But I noticed a curious thing, there was a tongue darting out of that dog's mouth and it was forked tongue. The dog was 18 inches off the ground and had a rather pointy square head, fairly large. Ricardo noticed it was probably a reticulated python. Uh, both Don and I opened up on it with M16s and all we did was make it angry. And that was not a good idea. Ricardo, on the other hand, went for his machete. And now it's raining now quite hard. And that snake crawled out of the bunker. What it was doing was looking for rats for dinner in the bunker. Probably wouldn't have hurt us any, but I, I didn't want to find that out. Uh, Ricardo disappeared with his machete after the snake. And Don and I waited and waited, and Rick didn't come back right away. And I said, you know, I think that snake probably got him. He said, Gunner, we're not going to see him until tomorrow. And much later at night, he came back, and he cleaned off his machete and put it away. No questions asked. At breakfast the next morning, in his rucksack was a snake skin. He had gotten the snake. He took it back to the base camp, buried it in the ground next to the barracks after hanging out out to dry, and uh, got permission to take it home. Um, it was a pretty big snake. 
it made a pile about two feet high by about 18 inches wide of snakeskin. And it was quite valuable. Uh, but it was uh, kind of one of the humorous memories I have. All right. Uh, let's see. And then what was uh, the monsoon season like when you were up there? I, I'm struggling to remember the time of year. It seems to me it was in, in the summer. It was uh, probably late summer, August rings a bell. Mm -hmm. um, you were kind of confined to your barracks. You'd open the door and it was like somebody, like being under Niagara Falls. It wasn't rain, it was just a torrential downpour. Uh, the reason they dug the uh, ravines or ditches around the barracks was that the rain was heavy enough it would wash the barracks concrete and all away. It wasn't unusual to come back during the day when you did go up to work to find your uh, foot locker or any other belongings floating in the barracks in two inches or three inches of water. And one night, a young man, uh, spec for Carlson from Minnesota, uh, decided he was going to take a shower. So he's got his Ho Chi Minh sandals on, his shaving kit, and his towel. And he walked out the door, and they had, uh, it looked like a pallet, you might call it, like a shipping pallet, with screen tacked to it over the ditch. And sometimes there'd be two of them together because the ditch would be that big. It would be four feet deep and maybe, you know, three and a half feet wide. And the rain would run like a small river through those uh, various uh, uh, trenches. And he left and the door banged shut and he never came back. And it's getting quite late at night, maybe midnight, and here, here comes Carlson back. Uh, he's kind of a red-faced, shorter stump guy. And uh, he's got some MP shirt on, that's all he's got. No shaving kit, no sandals, nothing, no towel. And he proceeded to tell us a story that he stepped off onto that bridge and lost his balance, slipped because it was very muddy, and slipped into the drainage ditch and literally washed all the way out of our camp company area, out of the base camp, into the dark out outside the base camp, and had to walk back stark naked to the MP post at night and uh, try to get back in. Fortunately, they didn't fire him. But uh, right. it's a good story to. <laughs> Okay. Uh, another piece of, of the morale picture, you talked a little bit about sort of racial issues and that kind of thing. Uh, was there much by way of drug use on the base? Uh, marijuana was fairly readily available. I can remember being at, in the uh, main uh, motor pool area inspecting a truck. And uh, during Vietnamization, they would bring the Vietnamese that were working in our 124 single battalion area to the motor pool through the dispatch station. And uh, we had one Papa San, we always called him, there were five of them that worked on the tires that he actually seemed to be ordering the others around. He didn't really get dirty. He wore the dark sunglasses and had the starch uniform and a beret. Very uh, uh, leadership-like looking person. And uh, shortly after the truck arrived, a Quan Can, which is a Vietnamese MP Jeep, pulled in behind the tr truck. And they arrested this Papasan, and they weren't very nice to him. They, they pushed him around a little bit. They inspected the truck, and they found at least two big blocks of marijuana pressed into a look like on a, uh, about the size of a patio stone, only three or four times wider, hidden in that truck. So he evidently was a drug lord <laughs> with the Vietnamese group, so he was probably supplying marijuana. Um, it wasn't unusual to find that some of the guys would... Uh, smoked marijuana, maybe did other things I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of. Um, I would say if there were 88 guys in the, in the uh, motor pool team, maybe half smoked marijuana regularly or occasionally. Very few of them used it that regularly. Um, the other half, and I fall into that category, drank their share of beer. Mm -hmm. uh, I distinctly remember uh, a flatbed truck with four pallets of beer slid off during monsoon season into the drainage ditch and uh, couldn't get out of the ditch. And le the driver left, and word got back to me that, that that truck was there, not just to me. But I remember getting 12 cases of Budweiser. It was a, a godsend, a gift <laughs> from that. I didn't drink them all at once, but I shared liberally with my friends. Okay. So there was definitely some marijuana use. I will say this about it, uh, the people that, that um, I I'll say served with, um, never used marijuana regularly. Uh, if you were going on guard duty, you didn't get near it. If you were going out in the field, you didn't want to be around anybody that did it. Uh, the Tom Houston that I mentioned earlier that I partnered with sought me out because he knew I wouldn't do anything like that, and I knew he wouldn't. Um, 
I can't say it didn't happen. I think the usage of marijuana got even more prolific after the 4th Division left in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were there that didn't want to be there and that was an escape for them, I think. Right. But part, certainly part of it was it was so very readily available. Mm -hmm. um, I can't recall any incidences of it being um, abused in any way. But I do distinctly remember that there were some gatherings where people were, remember the funny cloud of smoke and the smell from it. And I still remember that smell, but I'll let it go at that. Okay. Now, to what extent was it possible to sort of go off the base? Would people go into Play Coup or into I had like one that? pass into Play Coup. Play Coup was held by the VC most of the time and possibly even the NVA, the small village. I had one pass where I went into town. Um, at some point in 1969, the 4th Division actually liberated the village of Pleiku from the VC, and our commanding general was given the equivalent of the uh, Vietnamese Congressional Medal of Honor. We were all allowed to wear that ribbon, but mm -hmm. not the medal itself. I served for two generals. They all did six-month tours, Major General Papke and Major General Glenn D. Walker. Glenn Walker was the major general who was in the movie Patton. He was the uh, major that was promoted over the colonel that didn't get his unit across the river. Uh, I was very proud to be able to say I served for both of those gentlemen. They were excellent leaders, Papke and, and Walker. And would point out that um, Major General Walker's granddaughter was killed in Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember which. Uh, she was a lieutenant of plebe from West Point. Mm -hmm. Uh, tragic loss for a great man and his family. Right. Um, they, uh, they didn't afford regular passes into town. Uh, escape from Vietnam for a vacation, if you will, came down to R&Rs. You were allowed one short R&R, &R, and I never had that, or one long R&R. &R. And in September of 1969, I elected to use my long R&R. &R, um, I can't remember if it was six days and five nights or five days and six nights. And having been married, I arranged for my wife to meet me in Hawaii. We went to Honolulu. I flew to Phuket, I believe, by helicopter from Phuket to um, Cameron, I think. And from there, they, of course, made sure you were in a decent, clean uniform. Mm -hmm. And I flew, I flew from there to Hawaii. It seems to me it was a direct flight, but I don't remember now. And uh, landed in Hawaii first at the air, airport in Honolulu. Uh, had no idea where to go or what to do. And was very much looking forward to meeting my wife after being gone that many months. And a guy came up to me from a limo, wanted to know if I needed a ride. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I have $30. I can't afford a limo. And he said, don't worry about it. Just get in. And I kind of argued with him. I was afraid of what might happen. I didn't know. And he said, since you don't have much money, I can show you a very nice place right off Waikiki Beach where to stay. And he drove me to the beach um, area and one block off to a hotel. They arranged a very reasonable five-day stay. I think it was only $75 a day for downtown Honolulu in 1969. Pretty good. And um, then he gave me his card and said, when your wife arrives, call me and we'll go get her. Uh, I tried to pay him, he wouldn't take any money. Uh, my wife came in later that day and I called him and he picked me up, took me to the airport, picked my wife up, and offered to take us on a tour of the island with a picnic lunch because he singled out one soldier every time they came in to make that offer to him. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I never got to take advantage of that because my warrant officer was stationed at Schofield Barracks and his wife and two children lived there and he had arranged the same thing. He gave me a ring to deliver to his daughter and asked me to contact his wife as soon as I got there. So that very day, my wife and I called his wife um, and I would point out that Mr. Curry was an African American. Mm -hmm. He extended this courtesy to every man from our unit that went there regardless of race, religion, or creed. His wife promptly came and picked my wife up and I, took us to dinner, and drove us all around the island showing us all the major sites with her son and daughter. I presented the ring that Mr. Curry had picked up in Hong Kong for his daughter. And uh, it was probably one of the nicest things that could have ever happened. That was a, a very rare treat. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I've ever been to Hawaii. Um, and then from there, uh, it was very difficult to leave her and go back. 
but after five days of normal civilization, right. went back and finished my tour between September and, and March. Okay. Now, over the course of the time you were in Vietnam, did you have any kind of sort of physical or medical problems? Um, only, only. Well, there were three events during the uh, early part of my tour. I had mentioned we spread gravel in the parking lot. Uh, I think there's an acclimatization that took place. They gave us uh, two types of anti-malaria pills, a large orange pill on Monday morning and a small pill daily, and I took them faithfully. But while we were doing this chore, I don't know if it was the weather and the hard work or a touch of something, I passed out and they took me back to my bunk and I don't remember anything. And I woke up and I was quite hungry and I said to the guys in the barracks, uh, Oh, was it time for chow? And they said, yeah. I told them I was quite hungry and they said, well, you ought to be. You've been out of it for three days. They took me up to the med center and uh, they put down on my record, I think it was fever of unknown origin. I, that's what they put for malaria anyway, I believe. So everybody was exposed to it. Nobody knows. I don't know if that was malaria or not. Mm -hmm. On another occasion, we went out on a patrol. We had always worn our soft hats and carried our helmets and in this case, there was a new captain that was put in charge of this patrol and he insisted everybody wear their helmet. I can remember getting out on the patrol, sitting down in a bamboo stand next to a, a creek and uh, again passing out, probably sunstroke. Um, that was the end of wearing your helmets in the field after mm -hmm. that. The concern was head injuries from wounds right. and that's nice but in 110 degree weather putting a steel helmet on is probably not the brightest thing you could do. And then later in the fall uh, we were on a reactionary, we had been rocketed and mortared, and they took us out in a sweep um, around base camp. And we went parallel to the uh, perimeter, and I stepped into a sandy area and uh, bent my foot back. It turned out I broke a bone on my foot. I had stepped into one of these wooden booby traps, but I thought it was really strange because there was nothing to it. It, had, it was softer wood had the lid on it and it had been carved where it would break and it broke and nothing happened. One of the guys got down with his bayonet and was fishing around the box. He was going to dig that out for me and the NCO in charge of the patrol said, uh, let's don't do that. A lot of times they'll be, they know you're going to do this mm -hmm. and they booby trap it with a mortar round or artillery shell and I suspect it was probably a booby trap to booby trap. Mm -hmm. uh, I limped back and they said, well, you're, you have a broken bone in your foot. Um, we can put it in a cast, you, you're eligible for a Purple Heart, it was a combat action, it was no combat. Um, and then you, you'll go home and have to finish your tour and I said, what's the other option? Well, we can wrap it, leave your boot on for a couple of weeks and stay here and finish your tour. And I said, option two, wrap my foot, put my boot on and stayed there for the rest of my tour and went home on time. All right. Uh, what kind of impression did you have of the Vietnamese soldiers, the Arvins? I didn't spend a lot of time working with the Arvins directly. My experience was some of them were very professional uh, and very talented. Um, the actual uh, Arvins that I saw, I was never comfortable around them. I never knew whether to trust them or not. Um, they were forced into military service, much like our draft was, but they weren't forced for a year or two years or three years. They were forced pretty much for life. Mm -hmm. And uh, some were Vietnamese, some of them were NVA and VC sympathizers, and some were not. I don't have any personal knowledge of that. I can speak to the Vietnamese civilians that I worked with. I mentioned before, the one Papa Son said to me, uh, tonight don't be in the barracks, you're going to have a rocket or mortar attack. Um, he was very discreet about how he said it. Um, we got to be friends, and I think he cared about me as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, thought I was a good guy and wanted to tell me, uh, to be careful, and I appreciated that. I never felt he was a VC or NBA sympathizer, I just felt he knew about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew enough about him to find out he was Buddhist and he had two wives, and he showed me pictures of his children. Uh, I didn't know the other Vietnamese uh, that well, and had not served directly with Arvin, so I can't speak to that. My impression of what I saw then is fortified by what I know now, the American soldier was very much more professional, willing to put his life on the line. Um, the value system in Vietnam was different, and the reason I say that is an incident that happened on that bus going from the airbase to Campanari. 
Uh, we had stopped for some reason and on the far side, probably to get orders of some kind from a military compound. And on the far side of the road were a bunch of school children in a mission environment playing with something. And I couldn't figure out what they were playing. And later saw it was some kind of round. I, I wasn't familiar with the, the blooper they called the M79. But they were using a high explosive round. And that has an arming system where you have a ball bearing in it. And it has to travel so far before it explodes. And the bus driver explained to us what they're doing is that AG round, when you throw it far enough, that um, ball bearing type round activates it. And whoever picks it up, uh, it goes off. And uh, they thought that was funny, a funny game to play. Uh, somebody would be maimed. And, you know, it's a different environment. I found that hard to comprehend. That's not the kind of game that you would see going on here. So their value system was different than ours. All right. That's all I can say. Uh, another kind of just sort of stray thing to ask about, in your set of pictures you've got, you've got a bunch of, of some Jeep that you were rebuilding or whatever. What was the story behind oh, that? There's, I, there were some pictures I had hoped to bring. Uh, some of the things that happened, the attack at the air base where a uh, three-quarter ton truck and a do snap were blown up with satchel charges. Headquarters 7 Jeep, the motor officer, uh, Mr. Curry, was not authorized a vehicle. Battalion headquarters were, company commanders were, and he needed something for transportation. And in the compound area was a Jeep that had fallen off somehow, slid off Dragon Mountain, and the frame was twisted. And I had some mechanical background, having worked with my uncle. And we had a repair shop, and there was a guy in there that could paint. And I showed him how to take chains in a two and a half ton truck and square the frame up on that Jeep. And we stripped it down as best we could and hand sanded it. And I got a hold of some black lacquer from one of the drivers that I found had black lacquer. Uh, mixed it with uh, OD paint that we were authorized and got them to spray paint that Jeep. And then I found out we had some parts, canvas, rigging, seats, and things like that, and put that together. The motor and transmission and drive shafts, transaxles, all that was in good shape. Everything worked. Once we squared that body up and painted it, we put all those parts together. They, were, they had written off that Jeep. So I put it together and uh, put a spare tire on it, and I made a tire cover for the back of it. Headquarters 7, 124 Signal Battalion with our hand-painted logo, put it on that Jeep. Uh, earned me a lot of points with the warrant officer. You know that. No wonder uh, they wanted to keep you in the Army. And it might be. And uh, it turned out that the Colonel, he had bragging rights with the Colonel over that Jeep. The Colonel wanted that Jeep. And he told me this story, and he said, Colonel's not getting my Jeep. And then pretty soon I found out the colonel wanted me for his driver when his driver was leaving, a buck sergeant was going home. And uh, so Mr. Curry offered me that position and I said, no, sir, I'm staying with you. I'm, I'll be leaving as well. And that's not the kind, driving a colonel around is not the kind of thing I want to end up doing. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of my history with the, in the story with the headquarters, uh, 7 Jeep. The other vehicles were badly damaged enough we couldn't do anything with them. We stripped them for parts. I should explain, in, uh, in the Army you have different echelons, they call it, five echelons of maintenance at that time. First echelon just operates, adds fuel, lubes it. Second echelon can change major parts. Third echelon can rebuild some parts. Uh, fourth and fifth echelon is high electronics and things of that nature. We were a second echelon motor pool. We could change parts. I have a story about that. Uh, Spec 5 Grinnell came and got me and said, uh, we burn out an air compressor, which powered the brakes on a truck, and I put a new one on, and it burned up right away. Well, we couldn't always get all the parts you need, so what we were doing was taking a cardboard off the back of a notepad and peening it with a hammer to fit between the air compressor and the mounting. Unfortunately, after we burned up the second air compressor, and that was our last one, um, he, he couldn't figure out why they kept burning up. And I happened to take the cardboard off and notice an inlet port and an outlet port for the lube for the oil. And I took an awl and punched holes for both of those. We got another air compressor and put it on, tightened it down, and sure enough it worked. So what that forced us to do was go on a scouting mission. We couldn't get any more parts. So the warrant officer said to me, have you got any of that beer left yet? And I took a couple of cases of beer and we got some long range patrol rations. Uh, packs and he brought a couple of bottles of whiskey and we went to the fourth engineers at Camp Schmidt. And while I'm sitting there waiting for him to do the negotiations to get the spare parts for air compressors, 
I had my hat pulled down on my eyes taking a nap, and one of the guys that I work with, Dirk Kramer was his name, was in the fourth engineers, and he came up. 11,000 miles away, I ran into one of my best friends from work in Vietnam during the war. So it's a nice story. But that's how you got parts. You swapped parts with somebody else because we weren't authorized those parts. We actually had tools we weren't authorized. They took a 55-gallon drum for inspections, buried it in the ground with a lid, put all the tools we weren't authorized in the drum, waited until after the inspection, and dug it back up and took the tools out that we needed to, to rebuild parts. Um, kind of a funny thing about how the Army worked at that time. Right. Uh, now, what kind of losses did your unit take over the course of the time you were there? Because you were getting attacked periodically. Um, actually, of the 88 guys in my unit, the Cook and A Company was in the building they blew up. He had a small wound and got a Purple Heart. His two assistants were wounded. I never saw a uh, 124 Signal Battalion uh, soldier wounded. However, some of them were at the Ford fire bases running generators. Mm -hmm. They were overrun on occasion. Uh, some injuries took place there, but I never personally saw anyone uh, there lo uh, lost. Um, there was one injury I'm aware of. When you went on a patrol, they had a barracks set up outside of the headquarters company area uh, office for debriefing. And uh, one patrol, they came back, you put your rucksacks out on the bunks, uh, opened them up, laid out your, your materials, they inspected everything. That was always expected. Um, I, was, I was not on the patrol, but um, I heard a loud bang and uh, didn't know what was going on. Everybody rushed to the barracks to see what was going on. One of the guys on the patrol had gotten his hands on a 45 caliber pistol. And uh, the story went that uh, he hit the reject and dropped the magazine out of the pistol and then did one of these John Wayne things with the pistol. His best buddy was at the bunk across the way from him and they were horsing around. He pointed the pistol at him and said, bang, you're dead, and pulled the trigger and forgot there was a round in the chamber. He went to Japan first to, uh, we called it LBJ, Long Bin Jail, mm -hmm. named it after the president, LBJ. Mm -hmm. He went first there, the other guy went to Japan to the hospital. Um, I don't know any details. I don't know who it was that had the pistol. I don't know who it was that got shot. That's the only, and I do know that happened. There was one other incident. Um, Larry Algiers was our record driver, and occasionally some of our guys, he was a specialist fifth class, some of our guys would volunteer to go on, uh, on to, to base camp areas for generators that had to be flown up by helicopter. And in the morning, and I believe it was 10 o'clock-ish, he was going out on a Huey Slick, and we happened to be in the motor pool and noticed the Huey Slick crash. I believe it was a Slick, it could have been a, a Chinook, I don't remember. Uh, between the area of our motor pool and Dragon Mountain. Um, Larry was on that, Wrecker we called him, was on that, it crashed. Uh, later at Chow I found out, I didn't know he was on it at the time, we saw it go down. Uh, it crashed and he never came back to the unit. He was injured, not killed. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of injuries I'm personally aware of, but, but no deaths in our unit. Uh, I did see some, some things that happened, the battalion attack on the perimeter. There were three bunkers that were blown up. There were at least two guys in each bunker by satchel charges. Uh, they were not from my unit. Uh, certainly they were killed. And on Dragon Mountain, infantry unit had bunker one, two, and three, and all three of those were blown up by B-40 rockets. Um, there were three men to a bunker there. There were nine guys that were killed there. I don't know their names. I don't know details. Mm -hmm. But there were no bunkers left after the attack and uh, no bodies either. So okay. I'm sure that happened. So that's as close to... to death as I got with our unit and the helicopter I mentioned. Right. Uh, those are the only ones I'm aware of on okay. my tour. Are there uh, any other sort of incidents that kind of stand out in your mind from, from the time in Vietnam uh, you want to add to the record that you haven't thrown in here yet? Well, there's some humorous things. I can remember coming back from guard duty and of course the first thing you want to do is shower because you've been all dirt blown in your face, monsoon rains. Um, during Vietnamization, they hired uh, Monosans to come in and do your laundry for you. And uh, of course, unfortunately, the only water source was the shower. So it wasn't unusual for the guys coming back from guard duty to shower while Monosan was doing the laundry. Um, you kind of, you, you became inured to that. Um, they'd laugh and talk and you know, giggle to themselves. But, um, well, uh, that was a humorous thing. Okay. 
I can remember also as we got ready to, to pull out um, that they were getting very nervous, the civilians that worked for us, about us pulling out and leaving them behind. Uh, one of the young ladies, and I have a picture of her here, stopped me and, and uh, she wanted me to leave a picture I had of my wife and child with her and I, I don't know why. I refused to give her the picture but I gave her the brass picture frame. Um, I can remember one of the Vietnamese asking me to remember him after I left because he knew I was going home and that, that when I got home I should send him some money. Um, I never knew how to reach him and I never sent him any money but I've always remembered him because he became a good friend. Um, I can remember a duty I had one time. They brought um, during Vietnamization some of the mountain yards in and part of a what would have been a clan or family to do work and because I had taken French in, in college they thought maybe I could communicate with them so they put me in charge of managing the work crew that was cutting the grass that was growing up around the perimeter of the motor pool. That was exciting. Uh, none of them spoke French <laughs> and my French, my French uh, was pretty lame by that point but that was an interesting duty. Um, I can remember at on K, the canine corps was kitty corner behind us and one afternoon or evening one of the uh, dog handlers went out to feed the dogs and we heard a gosh awful racket. Uh, I don't know whether this proved out to be true or not but uh, the dogs went bananas, bonkers, whatever and later we were told the dogs attacked the handler and killed him. Uh, that was unnerving. We had uh, turned our weapons in, Don and I, and we're processing out at Pond Cave by that point. And on t two occasions we were attacked through the perimeter. The barbed wire was the only thing between us and wherever they wanted to come from. Um, I can remember uh, Buck Sergeant, I can't remember his name, but he was armed with a 45 caliber pistol standing in the doorway with his pistol drawn, telling us to lay on the ground as you could see shadows of guys with AK-47s running by. I uh, was very nervous about that, getting down to my last few days, knowing that that 45 was all stood between me and getting shot up, and uh, I never got over that either. It was kind of traumatic. Um, down towards the airstrip from Moscow was an outfit called 1st of the 10th Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, there was a Huey Slick gunship um, down there, and I would see the door gunner cleaning it. The interesting thing was, he was about a six foot four guy, and he had this really curly afro for, for, for a white American that was unusual, and in the Army. And uh, I would wave and say hi to him all the time, but I didn't know who he was. And I got back to work, and uh, I started to notice after a couple of months, that guy over there kind of looks like that guy I was waving to, and it turned out it was. When I got drafted, um, he was my replacement at work. And shortly, shortly after uh, um, he was hired in, he got drafted, and uh, we got to be pretty good friends. Uh, unfortunately, he had an aneurysm and died at 28 years old. Steve Rogo was his name. He was from 1st of the 10th Buffalo Soldiers, a door gunner. So that's kind of a sad story mm -hmm. that played out kind of strange. But uh, a lot of people were getting drafted at that point. Right. Survived the whole war as a door gunner. Oh, had an aneurysm in his fiance's swimming pool oh. at 28. So a sad, sad moment. Um, good guy. Um, can't think of too many other things to, to do. The, the daily routine was a lot of hard work. There were long days. It wasn't unusual to have only four hours of sleep. Uh, it wasn't unusual to be frustrated with nothing to take your mind off what was going on. Did they bring in entertainment or USO only, shows? Or only on like that? two occasions, and it's interesting you ask that. I have a picture, of, I believe, in my group of a Filipino group at the Enlisted Men's Club that came in in the fall, probably shortly before I went or after I went, came back from R&R. &R. They would not let Americans um, perform at the Fort Division base camp. It was too risky, but they allowed Filipino groups to come, and they did the best they could. For rock and roll, but it wasn't quite the same. Uh, but it was entertainment, and we enjoyed it. And uh, they did a, a professional job of putting on a show. And when we got to On K, again, they would not let Americans perform there, although there were some donut dollies, I'll call them, uh, that were kind enough to pass out donuts and share coffee with you. It was the first time I saw an American woman after nearly 14 months 
other than my wife on R&R, uh, was very pleasant to spend time talking with her and having coffee. Um, about two, two weeks or ten days before I left, they brought in an Australian group. Um, they performed as well music in a very small building environment and went from company to company doing that. Uh, it was a group of Australian guys. Um, they played modern music. I can't tell you any more about it. Mm -hmm. I could have been anybody. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was a nice uh, uh, diversion from what we were going through. And uh, we thoroughly enjoyed that. I can remember a couple other things that happened that are interesting. To get up to the barracks from the company area, there was a, a small three-step three step, and there was a kind of a tunnel behind the steps. And I went up and down the steps all the time rather than climbing up the bank. And after about the third day of doing that, one of the guys grabbed me and said, don't walk on those steps. And I said, why is that? And they said, because that's a cobra nest underneath the steps. Well, thanks for telling me that. And uh, I got down to my last three days, and uh, um, they virtually said, you're done, do whatever you want. And after chow one day, I went back and wrote a letter to my wife, and I thought, well, I'll take a nap. It's 9 o'clock in the morning, and the, the brand new executive officer came through with his riding stick and the company clerk, or battalion clerk. And I had my bare feet hanging out on the bunk, and he whapped me with a riding crop, and of course I said some unsavory things to him, and he put me on report. So I got called up. This was after the incident about the possible promotion. I got mm -hmm. called up to the company headquarters, and top battalion top uh, sergeant said to me, what are you doing here, Lang? And I said, well, I'm on report, Sergeant. And he said, well, what's that all about? I said, told him what happened. And he said, well, we'll see about that. And he went in and talked to Lieutenant Colonel Odiarn. And uh, pretty soon uh, he left, and Colonel Odiarn called me in. And, you know, I went to attention. He says, Eddie, he says, sit up. He said to me, aren't you from Grand Rapids? And I, I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, well, I'm from Detroit. And then we talked about the incident where I covered the guy so many times. And, mm -hmm the opportunity for promotion. He said, well, why are you here? And I said, well, your XO put me on report, sir. He said, we'll see about that. Top, get a hold of that guy. <laughs> so they brought the XO in, and I'm in the chair, and I go to get him. He says, no, no, sit right there. And he read the major off, up one side and down the other, and he said, don't you know, this man extended his tour. He should have been home already, that he's done an excellent job of service, and that he's getting a medal tomorrow on the parade ground, and you put him on report. He just, I, I could have died. He, uh, the next day, had to pin a medal on me, and he went down the line of 10 or 12 guys that were leaving. Some guys got good conduct medals, two bronze stars, the sergeant I had mentioned earlier, and the rest of us, Don, myself, and Keith, got Army Commendation mm -hmm. medals. All of us had been in some duress one way or another. He felt we earned them, and I feel we probably did too. He got to me and had to pin the medal on, and he pinned the medal on, but never congratulated me and walked away because he got put on report for putting me on report. <laughs> so it kind of it, it kind of justified. So it was good to have somebody from Michigan there at that time, mm -hmm. and a colonel that respected who you were. Right. Okay. So now you get back to the states. Where do you where do you come back to? I came back. Um, we flew, and I can't remember how. Probably by helicopter from on K Air Base to Cameron Bay, mm -hmm. the biggest piece of tarmac I ever saw. And all you saw when you looked off in the distance was the ocean and sand. And uh, it was really a strange thing to see after being where I was with all the red clay and the jungle. And uh, we were there overnight. Uh, they inspected our gear, took away. I had a crossbow and things that they thought I couldn't have, my tiger mm -hmm. fatigues, and took all that away. Of course, they kept them. Um, we packed, I didn't care, I was going home. We packed our stuff up and slept overnight at on Cay, or at Cameron and left from Cameron Bay by, um, seems to me it was uh, Flying Tiger Airlines. They had taken an airplane and cut the fuselage and added a section in so they could hold about 225 guys on one airplane. Mm -hmm. And they flew us to um, Yokosuka, Japan, mm -hmm. I'm not sure but Japan, and it started with a Y. Mm -hmm. And uh, they let us actually go through, and they warned us, you know, you have to behave, but you can go into the uh, shops and all in the airport terminal, and I bought a Seiko watch for my wife, I remember that distinctly, and uh, she still has it. And from Japan, we flew to Guam, and from Guam to Hawaii again. I don't remember spending any time at either of those air bases, mm -hmm. and, or, or Airports and from the airport at uh, um, 
Hawaii, it seemed we went to Alaska for a short stopover, but I could be wrong, mm -hmm. and then flew into SeaTac, Seattle Tacoma Airport. Right. Uh, they put us in their military uh, barracks there. Uh, uh, again, we went through another inspection of gear and everything. They, they woke us up at 3 o'clock in the morning for uh, breakfast of anything you wanted, steak, eggs, mm -hmm. everything. That was a nice treat. And then got to the uh, airport terminal and after the uh, inspect our baggage and they turned us loose and now you're on your own to get your own flight back, which I booked. And unfortunately, they had trucked up a busload of Hare Krishnas in their saffron robes and they proceeded to attack us for being warmongers. Mm -hmm. uh, we were called baby killers and things of that nature. The one that approached me um, started in on me and I asked him a question. I said, how old are you? And he said, 24. And I said, well, you'll be happy to know when I went in, I was 20. That means I couldn't vote. And that means you, as a voting adult, sent me to Vietnam and separated from my wife and family. And uh, I guess he was taken aback by that. And I just brushed him aside. I didn't touch him, but I walked away. And uh, he was still pondering that. And the next group proceeded to come over to attack me. And he came running up and said, not this guy. And uh, so I felt that that was justifiable payback. But I'm here to tell you, when we came home from Vietnam, we were not warmly received. Mm -hmm. But I'm also here to tell you, many nice things happened. I, I, I was flying home to visit my family from Washington, D.C. one day, and I always flew military standby because she had a guaranteed seat. Right. But there were occasions when the plane was full. And on this one flight, and it was uh, North Central, I think, the local airlines, mm -hmm. North Central, a businessman uh, who had first class tickets uh, waited to make sure I got on the plane. And he kept asking the flight attendant, are you going to get this young man on the plane? Because if not, I'm giving him my ticket. And I was quite embarrassed by that. And uh, she said, sir, just be calm, just stand there. And when no one came, they had some first class seats left. Uh, she gave me a first class seat and I sat with this gentleman mm -hmm. all the way back to Grand Rapids. And he actually took me to my home from the airport. I've never forgotten that. There were a couple incidences like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised at the kindness that people offered you. On the other hand, there were a lot of war protesters that it was very offensive the way they treated you. And as I mentioned to you earlier, um, I came home, let my hair grow up, uh, went back to work and put it all behind me. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the therapy that I went through when I went to the VA uh, a couple of years ago was uh, wear your fourth division hat in public and see what happens. And uh, I was on a walk with my wife one day down Five Mile Road um, by Plainfield, and I had my hat on, and I saw an SUV go by, and the gentleman in the SUV was uh, plotting. And I said to my wife, what was that all about? And she said, he's applauding your service. And uh, it's kind of emotional for me to talk about because of what a far cry it was from what happened. Um, I can remember two other things I should share. Uh, I got off the airplane in Grand Rapids. My dad was there with my son, my mom, my brothers, my wife, and my sister-in-law. Uh, I got down, and it's a cliche, I got down off the, uh, but back then you, you, you didn't go up to a, a ramp. Mm -hmm. you, you had a, a wheel step. Right. And I got down off the steps and uh, kind of got off to the side and I got down and kissed the tarmac and I was so glad to be home. And uh, never saw my dad cry. Um, but he came up to me and put his arm around me and he had tears in his eyes. Uh, it was very emotional for him. Uh, he was dying a thousand deaths the whole time I was gone, I guess. Uh, my family had an in-the-home service with a minister, a uh, full dinner and everything. I mean, it was a, a, ma a mass because I'm Catholic. And they sang the choir and everything. And In the military, there tends to be a lot of using the F word. Mm -hmm. And I turned to my brother and asked, would you pass me the F and salt? <laughs> and that's a memory I'll never forget. It got, I was trying so hard not to do that. And uh, it got dead son. And the look from my mother was enough to kill me. The minister, you know, the associate pastor is doing the mass. And just to tell you how imbued the F word was with the military, uh, we were on a patrol one time and there was a young minister, 24 ish, 25, on the patrol. And he's walking up talking to the different guys and encouraging us and sharing our hardships with us and trying to be one of the guys and he's starting to go after this and after that like everybody else. And he got to me and I put my arm on his shoulder and said, you know, Reverend, uh, we need you out here, no question about it, but we need you to be who you are, not be one of the guys, so please try not to use that word so often. <laughs>
So it wasn't an intentional, it was unintentional. It just happens. And if you go to anywhere in the military, it's probably still that way today. Uh, one other incident, and then that's all I can think of. We had a small apartment, and the back bedroom in that apartment had a space heater in it. And about a week to 10 days after I got home, that space heater went off. And my wife tell, has told this story. She was sharing it with her mother one day. And, uh, she said the bed shook, and I looked, and Joe was gone. And she leaned over the bed and looked down, and I'm on the floor. And she said, what are you doing down there? And I said, didn't you hear that mortar go off? Now I'm home for two weeks. And uh, it sounded like a mortar going off. And then I looked up and realized, well, that can't be. That's my wife right there. <laughs> that can't be a mortar going off. So it never leaves you. And she told her mother this story while I'm having coffee with her mother and father one Saturday morning. and. Uh, her mother's name is Maria and her father's name is Jean and she said, Jean, tell him what happened with you. And he didn't want to talk about it. She said, we're out on a walk one day and a car backfired. He ducks in the doorway. He didn't think to take me to safety. He ducked in the doorway and left me standing there. And she said, why did you do that? And he said, well, didn't you hear that motor go off? So he and I shared that in common. He's a World War II veteran. To look back over the whole thing, how do you think your time in the service wound up affecting you? I'll uh, say two things about it. And uh, almost everyone I talk to that ever served will tell you the same thing. I was proud to serve the people in this country. I'm very proud of my service. I'm very proud of the unit I served with and of what we did there. Um, I would do it again if called upon. And uh, I have to tell you, I was 20 years old when I went in. Although I was married, I was very immature. I think my marriage has lasted these 45 years uh, simply because I grew up a lot. It taught me two things. I've always been a little bit streetwise, um, but it taught me to um, make judgments. It taught me how to lead. I am today a leader for the company that I work with in, in my role. Um, it, it, it made an adult, uh, cognizant Christian citizen. Uh, makes me um, feel, looking back, uh, a bond with all servicemen and makes me understand what they've gone through is something I can't share with anyone that hasn't done it. I have five sons. I think that's a gift. Uh, my life was spared. There were occasions where it was at risk. Uh, I think, I, I, I believe God had a role in that. And there was a role for me to play. Uh, very proud to be an American. And I promise you this, if you ever leave this country and live somewhere else for a while, you'll be glad to be here. So that's what it did for me. It made me appreciate my country, my countrymen and women. And uh, I'm very proud of uh, who we are and how we are concerned, aware citizens, right. world citizens. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come in and tell us your story today. You're welcome. Thank you.